April 4th, 1991, 20-year-old Angela Hammond, who was four months pregnant, and her fiancé Rob attended a barbecue at the home of Angela's mother, Marcia. As events unfolded throughout the night, Rob ends up wondering where Angie is and if he will ever see his fiancé again or if he will ever be able to meet his unborn child. Hello, my fellow weirdos. If you're interested in the strange, dark, creepy, and mysterious, you have come to the right place. I just want to let you guys know before I get started that if you want to submit a story, true crime, paranormal, supernatural, creepy, mysterious, strange, whatever, any story that has happened to you, go ahead and head over to the website at www.darkcrossroadspodcast.com you can message me on there you can send it to me on facebook instagram twitter you can also send it to me on my email which is darkcrossroadspodcast at gmail.com i am so much looking forward to hearing from you i want to kind of start doing um a listener's tales or stories once a week I'll get a few stories and put it together, and we'll make um, that a day on the podcast. So start sending them in. I'm still excited. With that, let's get started. On February 9th, 1971, Angela Hammond was born to parents Marsha and Chris in Kansas City, Missouri. The couple re- relocated to Quaint Clinton, Missouri, a town 75 miles to the southeast, where they had a second child, making Angela a big sister. By all accounts, Angela was a popular, outgoing, and well-liked young woman without any enemies who might have reason to harm her. She was looking forward to her unfolding life, going by the nickname Angie instead of Angela. Angie Hammond was just beginning some of the most significant milestones in her life. She and Rob had begun dating in November of 1990, By all accounts, the two were absolutely smitten with each other. Angela was 19 years old and Rob is 18 years old, and it wasn't long before the two fell madly in love. Rob was a high school senior star athlete who was preparing for a career in the military, and Angie had started taking classes at Central Missouri State University while working at a local bank as a clerk. By January of 1991, less than three months of dating, Angie shares with Rob that she's pregnant and Rob could not have been more excited. Soon after, Rob proposes to Angie, and the pair became engaged. In the spring of 1991, they rent a trailer home and move in together in Clinton, and are both looking forward to starting their new chapter together. Angela and Rob seem to have a promising life ahead of them and were madly in love. They excitedly awaited the birth of their child, adding to the tragedy of her sudden abduction. Angela and Rob attended a barbecue at her mother's house the day of her abduction. Though the couple rented a home together, Rob intended to spend the night at his parents' house where he was babysitting his little brother. Angela either dropped Rob off or he left the barbecue. Sources conflict on this detail, so I'm adding both of them in here. This happened about 9 to 10 p.m. with the expectation that she would join him later on. Angie spent part of the night driving around town talking with her best friend, Kyla, while her boyfriend or fiancé was babysitting his brother. And after she dropped her friend off at her house, about 11.45 p.m., Angela went to go call Rob from a local payphone in the middle of the town. Angie and Rob did not have a home phone, so Angie stopped at the payphone because the two had plans for Angie to go to her parents' house that night. But she was very tired from the long day that they had and spending time with her friend and being four months pregnant. So she just wanted to go home and go to bed. So she called her fiance to explain that she was way too tired to come to his parents' house that night and was going home to rest, which he completely understood. As they spoke, she noticed an older model 1960s or 1970s green Ford pickup truck keeps circling the parking lot where she was at. It left, and which gave her relief, 
but her and Rob found it very weird that this vehicle kept circling the parking lot before. She continues to talk to Rob, but the truck quickly returns. This time, though, instead of circling, it parks right next to Angie in the payphone which she was talking on. This made her extremely nervous and prompted her to describe the truck to Rob. Soon the driver got out and a man made his way over to the payphone booth beside Angie. Angie mentions this to Rob, but in 1991, this really is not uncommon because a lot of people did not have cell phones and talking on the payphone was kind of a normal thing. The driver proceeds to go back to his truck and looks like he's grabbing a flashlight and according to Angie, it looked like he was looking for something. Rob recalls that he could hear Angie ask the man if he needs to use the phone booth in case the one he was using was not working. The man says no, but Angie and Rob start to feel really uneasy about the situation. And Angie, being the smart young woman that she was, starts giving a description of the man to Rob. Angie told Rob that the male driver was dirty looking and that he had a full mustache and beard. And she told him that the man was white, had glasses on, a baseball cap, and was wearing overalls. She could also make out a decal um, that covered the whole back of his window on his truck. It was a scene of a fish jumping out of water. While this greatly alarmed both Angie and Rob, nothing could have prepared them for what came next. All of a sudden, Angie let out a blood-curdling scream, and Rob hears the man say, in quotes, I didn't need to use the payphone anyway. Rob immediately runs out of his house to his car and races to the payphone's location, which was only a few minutes drive down the road. As he barreled down the road, I can only imagine what this man was going through. He spots a pickup truck matching the description that Andy gave Angie gave going the opposite direction that he is driving. He noticed a man driving and saw what appeared to be Angie in the passenger seat leaning over the driver, and he heard her screaming his name in an attempt to get his attention, screaming his name, Robbie, Robbie, over and over. He lurches into a U-turn to chase after the truck and accidentally wrecks his car's transmission. He still attempts to chase after this truck, and while behind the truck, he was only able to make out the letters X and Y on the license plate. Rob keeps following this green truck for about two miles down a dirt road. The truck takes a sharp right turn on W. Calvary Drive. I hope I'm saying that right. When Rob tries to take this turn, his air catches up to him and his car stalls and dies. Desperate and panicked, he leaps out of his car and he tries to follow the car on foot. But it's too late. Angie's gone. This was the last time Angie would be heard from or seen. Over 30 years later, the case remains unsolved. Around midnight, after realizing that he would be unable to catch up to this truck, Rob flagged down a passing vehicle and the driver took him directly to the police station where he told Clinton police about what had happened and provided them with the description of the man and the truck. At first, the investigators had a hard time believing Rob's story, and they end up saying that it's essentially a story right out of a movie, which honestly, it sounds like it is. (laughs) Their tune starts to change when they do discover Rob's car where he said it would be and when it was in the damaged condition he said it would be in. Police end up launching a search for both and provided a composite sketch of the suspect which notably looks nothing like the description provided by Angie and Rob, but nothing was discovered. Understandably, as tends to be the case in such investigations, police turned their attention to Rob as a potential suspect. Considering the possibility that he had fabricated the story as a means to cover up Angie's death at his own hands. However, neither Marsha, who is Angie's mother, nor Chris, 
Angie's father. Neither one of them suspected Rob, and he gladly took and passed a polygraph test. Now, I know polygraph tests are not the best way to go about things. I know they don't hold up in court, but sometimes it does hold up. It means something when they pass. Sometimes it means something when they fail, too, I guess. Furthermore, Rob's car was found precisely where he said it would, dead on the side of a dirt road, and its condition seemed to corrobor corroborate his story. Soon, two witnesses came forward to say that they had driven by that parking lot that night of Angie's disappearance, and they both confirmed Angie's being there, along with the green truck and the un unidentified person who was the abductor. Because of this, it became increasingly unlikely that Rob had actually been involved in his fiancée's disappearance. Angie's ex-boyfriend, 17-year-old Bill Barker, is also questioned by officials with the FBI and is also dismissed as a suspect. Authorities, along with more than 150 volunteers, searched various areas of both Henry and Clinton counties. After nearly two weeks passed from Angelo's disappearance and the Missouri Missouri Royal, I cannot say that word for the life of me, crime squad joins authorities in their search for Angela. The squad focuses primarily on finding the pickup truck that is believed to have been involved in Angie's kidnapping. Authorities request that home or property owners should check out buildings, cabins, barns, or other structures on their property for any sign of Angie. After searching extensively, extensively since 18... Oh my God. Blah, 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 blah. After searching extensively since April 15th, the Missouri Rural Crime Squad, I did it, announces the end of their formal search. An appeal by the Missouri Rural Crime Squad to residents to search barns and abandoned houses failed to turn up any traces of Angie. This is all according to Police Chief Robert Hyder at a press conference. In the week of Angie's abduction, Rob was cleared of any suspicion by law enforcement, and a few local witnesses came forward saying that they saw the green truck lurking around the town in the days leading up to April 4th. The subsequent investigation took detectives in many directions. Police end up looking into possible connections between Angie's abduction and two other nearby abductions, which were less than 100 miles away earlier that year. These abductions were of Trudy Darby of Max Creek, Missouri in January 1991 and Cheryl Ann Kinney of Nevada, Missouri in February 1991. They both disappeared from the convenience stores at which they had been working. Trudy Darby was working at the K&D convenience store and her abduction was around 10 p.m. She noticed two men outside acting kind of strange she ends up being worried and calls her son, Waylon, who arrives 10, min 10 minutes later. I'm sorry, I'm laughing because I I have a son and his name is Waylon. And it's just brought a lot of pictures of him to my mind. <laughs> so she called her son, Waylon. He came to see her 10 minutes later. But when he gets there, she ends up being gone. Her coat and purse are found inside and $200 are missing from the register. Two days after Trudy went missing, police searched the little, okay, I'm going to spell this because I cannot say this for the life of me, little N-I-A-N-G-U-A. If you know how to say that, please send me a message. Okay, little whatever that word is, river. Trudy's nude body is found along the riverbank. Law enforcement finds blood, hair, and a 38 caliber shell casing near the river. An autopsy would be conducted the next day and evidence would show that she had been raped, robbed, and ultimately shot twice in the head before her body was dumped. However, a pair of half-brothers would later be charged with Darby's abduction, rape, and murder, making it unlikely that they were responsible for the abduction of a woman, Angie, whom by all accounts they did not know. Furthermore, while Max Creek and Nevada, the town Nevada, aren't too far from Clinton, they are each approximately a 70-mile drive away, a little more than just down the road. 
Cheryl Kinney goes missing after she clocks out of work. Typically, she would clock out at midnight, but this evening, she clocks out at about 10 p.m., the same time as Trudy clocked or went missing. By 10.17 p.m., she set the store alarm. She never arrives home and is never heard from again. Her white Chevrolet is later found abandoned in the store parking lot. Her body has not been recovered. So going into theories on Angie's case, one of the theories is the serial killer theory. As is often the case with unsolved disappearances and murders of young women, plenty have floated the theory that Angie was the victim of a serial killer who happened upon her. This would explain why the police would struggle so much to locate the green truck with a very specific mural on its rear windshield, particularly if the killer was merely passing through town at a very odd time of night. Two serial killers that have been mentioned in relation to this case are Kenneth McDuff and Tommy Sells. McDuff has committed murders in the state of Missouri. And at this point of his life, following his release from prison in 1989, All of his known crimes were committed throughout Texas, so he was not in the area at the time. While he did eventually move back to Kansas City before being apprehended again, it appears that he was still in Texas when she was abducted. Now, the other one, Tommy Sells, seems like more of a possibility simply because he committed murders all across the country. He was in various different regions throughout the United States, at this time, it has not been pinpointed where he was at because he was going everywhere. However, there are some factors that point to this not being the work of a serial killer. For instance, it would be rather sloppy for a serial killer to make their vehicle and their person so conspicuous. Uh, I cannot talk tonight. Their vehicle and their person so conspicuous and thus easier to identify. Identify. Additionally, the abductor attacked Angie while she was still on the phone and then said something revealing his voice. While it's certainly possible that Angie was the victim of a serial killer, the abductor made so many blatant mistakes that it seems unlikely or at the very least, he was incredibly sloppy. Another theory. Crime of opportunity. Now, this is a very common thing that happens. I'm not going to say it, but I do not think that that's what this is. It has been said that she might have been attacked and abducted by a stranger who simply decided to assault a vulnerable young woman that he ends up finding alone on the side of a road late at night. I mean, yes, this could happen. Yes, it does happen all the time. Just doesn't seem the case in this one. I don't think this is it. It it would explain why the police have struggled so much to track down the suspect. Also, if they did not have a real connection with her or if this was just a one-time deal. Uh, However... It can be assumed that a random attacker that late at night in a small town in Missouri would at least be local and maybe they would have been found out by now. This also makes it even stranger that the police have not been unable to track down the suspect or the vehicle with the big giant fish jumping out of the back window. That being said, as the saying goes, stranger things have certainly happened. And another theory is the mistaken identity theory. Now, this theory has recently, very recently, like past two years, has come about. In my mind, in my thoughts, I personally find this one the most realistic. Okay, hear me out. Police have recently went to the public Just in 2021, the 30th 
anniversary of her disappearance, stating that it could possibly be a case of mistaken identity. The theorist states that the abductor mistook Angela for the daughter of a police informant who was working undercover for a narcotics bus whose cover had been blown. This man who was working undercover's daughter's name was Angela, and she went by Angie also, and she was also living in Clinton at the time. Police have stated that she also looked extremely similar to Angie that went missing. They looked very similar at the time, like age, face, hair, everything. This theory might seem particularly far-fetched to some people at first glance. It is a chilling piece of the puzzle, though. This theory sometimes also gets strengthened because of a very creepy piece of the evidence, a note which was constructed from magazine clippings sent directly to this informant whose daughter was also named Angie. Okay, I'm going to read this little note here. It reads, hello, N-O, which was short for number, and then redacted informant's number. It actually had had it on there. It knew this informant's number. We know who you are. N-O, again, redacted informant's number. People like you deserve what you get. We know where your foxy daughter is at. She will see us soon. Tell, and then another redacted, and then it shows the informant's wife's name. She has our deepest sympathy in her further loss, and then just goodbye. And then redacted, unclear if this is informant's number again or an actual name. The informant, the, blah, blah, blah. the informant was reportedly living with his family in Clinton at this time, He stated that he was perplexed to receive such a letter while his daughter Angie sat safely in their home. And perhaps more chillingly, the letter was postmarked April 4th, 1991. Now, if you remember in the beginning, April 4th, 1991 was the very day that Angie Hammond was abducted. Though most sources I've seen refer to this as a ransom letter, It has never actually been any claims of an actual ransom or instructions on how to deliver a ransom. This just seems more like a really cruel attempt to hurt the informant and to enact revenge. Also, an anonymous tipster apparently called the Clinton Police Department rather recently, around the time of 2021, to provide two names that they claim are connected to Angie's disappearance. Police are reaching out and they wanted to further the conversation with this person that called. In quotes, it says, I would really, really be interested in having a conversation with this person. It can completely be anonymous. It can be a telephone conversation. I will protect your identity. I can guarantee that. This comes from a police officer, Abbott, who was covering this case. The police have asked this anonymous tipster to come forward so that they can talk to them and glean any information they might have on the case. However, since this announcement, there has been no further information that has come forward. In a spring 2021 interview with KY3 News, Clinton Police Captain Paul Abbott details that the department officially believes that it would be difficult for one single person to pull the abduction off, leading them to believe that there are multiple people involved. Two years ago marked the 30th anniversary of Angie's abduction, and there are still surprisingly very few answers, but there are many that still hold hope. The anonymous tipster and the police's pursuit of the missing mistaken identity angle lead many to believe that this case could still be solved. Fortunately, the Clinton police have refused to let this case go cold and have continued to pursue any and every possibility in the hopes of solving Angie's abduction. 
It is highly likely that Angie and her unborn child left this world shortly after her abduction. I hope that her family and her loved ones are able to have closure soon. And with saying that, I know that they most likely will never have closure, but I hope that they can have some semblance of peace. Sadly, Angie's mother, Marcia Cook, passed away in May of 2021 without ever finding her daughter's abductor or her remains. A reward is still being offered for the leads in this case. Where the case remains today is that Trudy's case was eventually solved with the convictions of half-brothers Jesse Rush and Marvin Cheney. However, Cheryl and Angie's still remain unsolved. Investigators suspect that Jesse and Marvin were involved with either Cheryl or Angie's case somehow. However, they have not been charged and they do not have any leads to this. And now police are looking for the public's health to hopefully identify the suspect from 1991. They're also asking for whoever submitted an an anonymous tip in early 2021 regarding the ransom note to come forward so that the conversation can be furthered. Police believe Angie was most likely murdered. Angie is described as a white female with brown hair and brown eyes. She has a scar on her upper lip and she wore contacts. She was four months pregnant at the time of her disappearance. She was 4'11", 120 pounds, and loved by many. Thank you for listening and hanging out with us today. If you want to hang out some more, follow us on social media, visit the website, um, tell your friends and family about us, send us a like, uh, rate us. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Pinterest, the website. You can email me. You should do that so that I can get a case from you and we can read it in the listener's tells. And with that said, I hope that you hang out with me next time. Goodbye.